So Germany in particular produces a lot of the art and the literature of the Romantic movement. And there are reasons for that, but we don't need to get into it. And out of this comes another social movement, and this is the Lebensreform people. So, especially from Germany, um, they emphasize physical fitness and natural health. Does any of this sound a wee bit familiar? <laughs> this was not invented in the 60s. <laughs> um, so there's all variations on this theme of reestablishing a connection with nature, that that's what's healing and that that's what, you know, is going to make it all better. Everybody from Isidore Duncan to Leon Trotsky to Franz Kafka passes through this world at some point. Okay, so there's all this foment of ideas going on. Gandhi was a fan of a Lebensreform. He sets up a nature cure clinic in India. So that goes um, east, and what goes west comes back this way is um, yoga and Ayurvedic medicine and um, Hinduism and Buddhism and meditation. So there's this sort of you know trade where the, the fruits and the nuts kind of you know <laughs> back and forth with each other. Um, so the Labour's Reform people set up their own schools, their own clinics, um, and their own intentional communities. So this is Ascona in Switzerland. This is like the Big Sur of the age. This is 1903, I think. Um, now some of these people are school teachers in Berlin. And they start taking their students out on hikes, you know, after school, because they're all into getting back to nature, right? So you go out in the mountains, you have a hike. The afternoons extend into weekends, and then the weekends even get longer. And eventually what happens is all these teenagers from sort of middle-class Berlin, they drop out of their middle-class lives, and they coalesce into their own subculture. And it becomes a lifestyle. And hence we come to the Von der Vogel. Now, I'm always really curious. How many of you have heard of the Von der Vogel? Oh, this is great. It's way more than I've ever seen. That's amazing. Uh, usually nobody raises their hands. And then I get to say, well, you know the drill. Ignorant of history, condemned to repeat it. Um, so here we are with the von der Vogel. Um, so this is the origin of the youth hostel movement. Because what they do is they wander around rural Germany and they take over abandoned buildings, including castles and farms and all kinds of stuff. And anybody can stay there for free. So they're wandering all around you know, in, the, in the mountains. They're singing folk songs. They write a lot of their own music. They play with fasting, raw foods, vegetarianism. They are the anarchist vegan squatters of the age. Okay, Not much has changed. Uh, this is all before the year 1900. All right. So the connections between the Lebensreform, the von der Vogel, and the 1960s subculture in the US, uh, they're startlingly direct. So for instance, these two painters set the uh, artistic style of the age. This is 1900. This is not 1965. And what I have, the red arrow up there on the top, that's a peace sign. I don't know if you can see it, but they're already using that as their icon, as the peace sign. So it's World War I. Some of them are draft resistors. I mean, they, they're pacifists. They don't want to fight this war. Um, and there's already a lot of immigration from especially Germany, other parts of Europe, coming into the United States. So they sort of ride that wave. And they, they get to the United States. They're transplanted. Um, and where do they go? Well, you're not going to do this in Michigan. They come to California. I mean, you're going to wander around half naked and eat fruit. <laughs> this is where they land. <laughs> California. There's an entire book about the history of these people coming to the United States, setting up camp here. Lots of other examples. Um, this was a, you know, two of the German immigrants who wrote some of these texts. These become basic books for the, the hippies in Haight-Ashbury in the 60s. Um, so this is an unbroken line of cultural continuity. And I mean, literally, it's some of the same people. They're the immigrants, then there's one more generation, and then it's right into Woodstock. And Jefferson Starship, and Frank Zappa, and the Beatles, and they know these people, and it's this unbroken line. I was just amazed to learn this history. Um, anyway, what we need is an oppositional culture, right? We need an actual culture of resistance. What we've got is this alternative culture, right, that refuses to take up resistance. So I started to make my handy-dandy chart. I'm very pleased with this chart. Um, we have bigger versions of it, not to worry. So I started to make my chart, and I was trying to figure out, you know, where did this go wrong? What exactly are the parts of this culture that have got the, you know, have got the wrong thing going? And suddenly I had this moment where the light, go, light bulb went off because I realized that I was looking at a culture that had been created by the teenage brain. This was a, cu a culture that had been created by adolescents. Um, in the year 1911 in Germany, there were more 17-year-olds than there ever would be again. Right? So of course, you know, they create their own little subculture with the von der Vogel. The whole thing gets transplanted to the United States. It goes dormant for a generation. It starts to pick up speed with the beatniks, many of the same themes, but it really comes into its own at about 1960. What happens in 1960? It's another bumper crop of 17-year-olds. Of course, this is what they're attracted to. It's a culture created by people exactly like them. So of course, this is the most appealing thing on the planet. So alternative culture. I've got this broken down. It's a little bit bigger. All right. 
Well, the main difference between the alternative and the oppositional is really basic. Are you hostile to the concept of political engagement? Because on the oppositional side, you consciously embrace the concept of resistance. And that's just absolutely flat out. That's the basic thing. And that's what we're missing right now. We don't have an oppositional culture. So to break this down a little more, uh, on the um, alternative side, change, of course, is seen in psychological and cultural terms. Right? And that goes right back to that liberal radical distinction again. Um, because for the oppositional culture, it's <clears throat> got to be economic and political. You're trying to take control of these institutions so you can dismantle them in some way. So over on the alternative side, it's individual consciousness is your appropriate target, right? Because you're trying to change people's psychology. Um, again, very liberal. And over on the other side, actually, you're going to you're going to target concrete institutions, the, the ones that have the power. Um, so these are the adolescent values of a youth movement over here. Um, and for a real culture of resistance, we would need adult values of discernment and responsibility because this is going to take a whole lot of sacrifice. Um, so for the adolescent brain, of course, all authority is rejected out of hand, whereas on the other side, legitimate authority is accepted and cultivated. Um, so a lot of this is, again, that sort of liberal radical distinction um, and that focus on the individual being the hallmark of liberalism. So you know, personal example becomes this political strategy. I mean, I don't think ever before in the history of the world have people taken up personal example as an actual political strategy, but that's sort of what we've been left with you know, here at this, this bad moment. Um, so, you know, you get this emphasis on things like, you know, gardening and riding your bike, and I mean, they're good things, but these are not, these are not actually political strategies, right? Um, and so it's your personal carbon footprint, right? That's what we're all supposed to be focused on is, you know, what we're consuming, what we're not. And I just have to point out, <laughs> am I the only one who's noticed that when you're talking about carbon footprint, that is the only time that men try to prove they're smaller? <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Um, so, uh, by their nature, agricultural societies are imperialist, right? They're based on drawdown. Um, civilization follows that same pattern over and over where they conquer the region, they've got the colonies, they extract what they want, they leave the place a desert. Um, that's been going on for 10,000 years. And what that means is for 10,000 years, these invading, sadistic, you know, cultures of drawdown and entitlement have come into contact with other cultures that, many of which were egalitarian, peaceful, sustainable cultures, right? This is the pattern for 10,000 years. In all of that time, the living example of a culture that is egalitarian and sustainable has never once stopped the invaders, okay? It has never once worked as a strategy, okay? They've seen the good example. It does not change the invaders, okay? History is literally the story of those invasions wiping out the nice people and this is what we're left with, is the sociopaths on top. So we just need to really say this out loud. Personal example has never worked. We've got to give this one up. There's too much at stake.